Oh, uh, I want to welcome you all to Reflections Projections 2000 th 2007. I'm really glad you're here. Um, if you look around, you'll see some of us wearing orange shirts like uh, these two in front. These are the conference staff. They've helped put this together. I, I say help. They've, they have put it together entirely. And uh, the amount of work that we've done in the past two months has been staggering, and I have no trouble saying they're the best conference staff that I've seen while I've been here. So when you see them, give them a hand. So we've got an exciting weekend of talks that are coming up, and I know you all have programs. Uh, you obviously all know who's here tonight, so, uh, so I won't waste too much of your time. Um, if you see anyone uh, wearing a, a VMware shirt or a Microsoft shirt or any of our sponsors at the job fair, please thank them as well. It's because of them that this entire event is free for everyone. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jim, who's going to introduce Randall. Hi, everybody. Tonight we have a very special speaker. He is one who has redefined Space Cowboy. Instead of going into space, it is riding a rolling chair around NASA with a Cat5 cable used to lasso a robot. <laughs> he has since advanced from there to uh, pencil and paper. This is technology for you folks. But Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we all love to log on and enjoy ourselves laughing at usually ourselves and possibly those of us who aren't quite as geeky. For your enjoyment, I introduce to you the president of the internet, Randall Monroe. It's on now, so working? OK, better. So it's really great to be here. First of all, uh, before we really get started, I want to mention, I did a comic a little while ago about a sleep schedule involving, <laughs> it's this 28-hour day. It ha it's, it's an interesting idea. You know, I was looking at it on paper for a while, and uh, it made a lot of sense. You get to stay up as late as you want every day, go to sleep, then sleep a full you know, eight, nine hours a night. It sounds like a great idea. Don't do it. <laughs> Right now, I, I slept, I've slept now and then, you know, in the past, but not in any sort of a regular schedule. And so, at the very least, this is going to be entertaining for me. <laughs> but it's actually similar to the, another recent comic about mind alteration, where I talked about the effects of drinking on programming. <laughs> so... The idea is, this is a cool thing we'll try out here, that you know, at the more your BAC goes up, the lower your programming skill gets. But see, apparently Microsoft has found that <laughs> if you get the BAC just right, So, so I feel like there are two things worth pointing out here. First of all, I don't think anyone has noticed this yet, but if you look at the uh, numbers given for the bounds on the BAC, it's somewhere between, you know, point, I think, 129 and uh, 138 uh, or thereabouts. So if you want to get the absolute peak programming skill out of this, your blood alcohol should be about 0.1337. <laughs> the other thing I've learned about this, I learned after drawing the comic a little a couple weekend or two later, which is that there may be a programming peak here, but uh, you know, you, you, to work out exactly how this works, you need to do some uh, integration of these Kronecker del delta functions. But the basic point is, if you pass that alcohol level with an extremely high, if you pass that alcohol level at an extremely high speed, you are not there long enough to do anything useful. You, you hit there, you hit the point where then you're no longer really coherent, you know, too coherent. 
and then you hit the point where you're lying on the bathroom floor, <laughs> but at that point, you can still use IRC. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was lying on my bathroom floor. <laughs> Important lessons about drinking on an empty stomach. Um, but I had my laptop next to me. <laughs> and I was just type, kick, hello. I wonder if I can blog. <laughs> so anyway, it is great to be here. I'm going, we're going to do a bunch of question and answer. That'll be the majority of this. But first, I have a story about kites. So a while ago, I got, I got into kite flying. And for me, the big challenge is see how high you can get a kite. And I noticed that, you know, like if you go somewhere, Walmart and so forth, they sold the string in, you know, 200-foot spools. And that seemed kind of silly to me, because you know how many of those you have to tie together to get anyth anything, you know, at all interesting? So what I did is I went down to the, the fishing supplies place and got, said, I need deep sea fishing line. <laughs> and so I bought a, a couple of kilometers total of line <laughs> and a 12-foot kite. And I've actually looked up the FAA regulations on this, and they say that as long as the kite is under five pounds, you can basically fly it as high as you want. But there was dev so we got these kites and we could get them up, you know, on this, you know, kilometer of string where the kite is just a speck if you can focus on it, right? You know, mostly invisible. There was one point where there was a helicopter circling, and <laughs> you know, part of me is like, don't do that, you know, go away, don't let this be about me. The other part of me is, oh man, if I could catch a helicopter. <laughs> So here, when I, was, when I was still doing this back in college, I had an interesting situation where, okay, so I have a kite and I've been flying it. And I tie it off to a tree. So it's going up here and it uh, hangs. The engineering students can tell you what curve that is. But <clears throat> yes, catenary. Part cat, part canary. You know what? I have avoided that question. <laughs> <laughs> because depending on the answer, I may or may not be wanted right now. <laughs> so, okay. I had this kite. It was, going up, it was going up far enough that you could not, you know, you can't really see the kite. And the string, kite string past, you know, 20, 30 meters, you can't see that either. You know, it's just blue sky. So what I noticed is I was flying this kite and the wind was just right. It had angled the kite around. It was going off campus. But before it went off campus, it went right over the freshman dorms. So <laughs> I took some string and I tied it here. and let it dangle down. <laughs> now, now, this is a very flat campus, and it's very, uh, maybe not this flat, but it's, uh, you know, there aren't that many trees around here. It was just like a building and a big open field in front of it. And so then, and thanks to this, there was a string hanging down that just disappeared up into the sky. This was, <laughs> this, this was maybe a couple hundred feet, you know. So people would come in or out of the dorms, and I was just sort of standing there looking at this string as if I didn't know how it got there. <laughs> you know, giving it little experimental tugs and, and just, huh, how about that? Now, and this is, this is the only time in my life I have ever seen someone do a triple take. <laughs> they, would, they would, you know, walk past and see it and, you know, and say, oh, that's kind of strange. Oh, it's a string. <laughs> And so I gathered a crowd, managed to convince a few of them they were having a drug trip. Um, <laughs> because until you see it, you really can't appreciate how weird it is to see a string that's going straight up and there's just blue everywhere. <laughs> and 
honest to God, I had one, uh, one girl decide that the only possible explanation was there was a dome over the campus. <laughs> It was, because uh, everyone, you know, because you, you, there's a, it's all blue, so there's no room for a helicopter. There's nothing, uh, you know, you'd think if there's something holding it, you'd see it, because you don't realize how far away things can be. So, you, you know, you couldn't see the kite, you couldn't see any of that. And so people were just coming up with these explanations, you know, okay, maybe, there, maybe it's, maybe it's a, a space elevator. <laughs> you know, the, one of the first things they've dropped for that. Or, um, yeah, and, and there was the girl with the, comment about, no, there ha it must be a transparent dome over campus. There's nothing else that could be doing this. <laughs> and even with that, with that one, her boyfriend was like, you know, <laughs> hold on a minute. Um, but no, it, it freaked these people out. And what really actually confused me, what, what like startled me about this was, you know, they came and they, you know, boggled at this and said, what do you do? You know, should we call the Weekly World News? This is completely inexplicable. What a mystery. You know, tug on it a little bit. And then... They, and, and, you know, and then after a while, the people would just say, huh, that doesn't make sense, and then, you know, wander off. <laughs> and this was just so alien to me, because how can you have something intriguing like that and, you know, not try to figure out what's going on? And I would have, you know, if I had seen that and not known what it was, I would have stayed there until I had figured it out, you know, until we had, like, dragged it down or... <laughs> so, but then what was really great is now doing... XKCD and the sort of people who read it, realizing that it's not just me. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of people write in with that sentiment saying like, oh, you know, th the stuff in your comic, you know, these nerdy ideas or whimsical things, um, you know, I really identify with that. The comic I did that has gotten the most feedback, with the exception of the time that I made the internet map and made 4chan really small and all of them wrote to me angrily. <laughs> Other than that, the comic I have drawn that has gotten the most feedback was not the one that got po pasted around the most. It wasn't a programming joke. It wasn't any of that. It was the comic about when you're driving and you notice that your turn signal is in sync with the guy in front of you. <laughs> and I had, you know, something like a hundred letters saying, I do that too. We must be the only two people who do that. You know, <laughs> I thought I was alone. And, and that's really the feeling I get from drawing the comic and hearing about it. So that's really great. And thank you, everyone, for showing up here. So now, we'll do questions for a little while here. Um, I want to start the first question uh, with a question to you, which is, so I had this uh, kite apparatus here. And you know, that, the, the string prank was fun. And I wanted to take it a step further. So I figured, okay, you've got this, you know, sky hook, this point that you can attach things to. And you've got it going over the freshman dorms and this crowd of people who are easily confused. <laughs> what do you drop on them? <laughs> so I've been trying to decide on something that would be... <laughs> oh dear. Red spiders. People write to me now and then and say, when am I going to, you know, finish up the Red Spiders arc? And I have not forgotten it. It may have been, you know, 200 strips since the last one, but I'm just sooner or later. So that's a good one. Um, spiders dangling from a string. Although, inchworms do that. Like, you'll, you'll see an inchworm, you know, dangling, from, looking like it's hanging, or one of the, the things that has the stream of silk, like, or, you know, whatever it is. And biology is not my thing. <laughs> and sometimes they'll be, they'll be somewhere in, and there's nothing above them. And I had never connected that until just now. Because that always confused me. I was like, how is it hanging there? There's no tree. But, huh. <laughs> so, what, what I want to go for with this, with this uh, dropping thing prank is I want to get the maximum like inexplicability. I want something that, like, they can't deny that it's trying, you know, that it means something, but exactly what it means isn't very clear. Um, 
so does anyone does anyone have any ideas? Bacon. Bacon. <laughs> and I could have a little button under it. Push button, receive bacon. <laughs> And they push the button, and bacon actually falls from the sky. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. See, so far, my, I think my, my, uh, the best I could come up with so far was an off-the-hook phone. <laughs> Especially if, you know, like one of, the cord, one of the handsets with the cord coiling up, going upward. <laughs> Especially if you could get, like, a little uh, speaker in it. So it would actually be saying something, you know, <laughs> like, uh huh, true. Yeah, I mean, you could do it. There are a lot of there are a couple ways you could do that. Um, you could also, so you could have, you know, like uh, the little the Silent Hill girl calling for help or something, <laughs> or just if you'd like to make a call, please hang up and try again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Oh? Really? She did? The no. It was Ruth Buzzy, wasn't it? Was it? I th it was either Lily Tomlin or Ruth Buzzy. You know, I'm sorry, this isn't the party to whom you are speaking. From the Laugh In or something? No. Yeah, that was back. That was before you were born. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm from the internet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, yeah, it's obviously a cat toy. <laughs> no, see, if you can, if you can put a, a, an impact white stroked font caption underneath it, then I'll pay attention. <laughs> and preferably, you know, bad grammar, maybe a picture of a cat in there somewhere. Well, then, then I'll be with you. Exactly. No, and, and I also like the idea of dropping scripture. Um, possibly... Possibly pages of the Bible with sort of randomly selected sections, you know, highlighted or censored out, saying, <laughs> like, or didn't you understand, you know? So, I'm, I'm waiting for someone to do something truly horrifying with this, you know? I, I, uh, I, I gave a, a version, you know, I, I let the MIT kids in on this idea because I was flying the kites off of their fields once I moved up to Massachusetts, and... So I'm just waiting for some news story, you know, because the, they do the incredible things where they'll like leave a, a police car on the dome, and you know, or things like that. And so I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to get a police car falling <laughs> from the sky. <laughs> so, but so that, that's the challenge is you you guys have to come up with something too. I don't know how how windy it is out here, but as long as it's pretty flat, so it should be good for kite flying. <laughs> I wouldn't want to catch myself. <laughs> like, I'd put it up there, and I'm so absent-minded, it would be like a few minutes later that I'd wander back and be like, oh, man, a Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know which part of me would be, uh, you know, would win in that decision. Is like the part that wants to figure out what's going on or the part that really likes candy. <laughs> so... We'll do audience questions for now. We, you may want a microphone or you should speak up. Um, if there, there are some folks with microphones. Please wait for the microphone so it can get recorded and anybody in this room can also hear you. Yes. All right. You? What does XKCD mean? <laughs> oh, man, the most common question. Now, um, XKCD is nothing more than a point in the space of four character strings that I chose because no one else had it. <laughs> I spent, um, it was like 10 years ago that I was sitting up trying to pick a screen name on like, you know, instant, on one of the instant messaging services. And I wanted, and I was really tired of changing my name every time my interests changed. Like I, I registered uh, Animorph 7 back in the day. <laughs> and, uh, oh yeah. Didn't know anyone else remember those. Awesome. Like, I read those religiously up until, you know, they got repetitive. It was, it was around, I think, book 27 was really where I lost it. But they, uh, and then I was Skywalker 4, back when you could still get a name like that. Uh, 
and various other things. And then finally, I'm like, you know, each time who I am is changing, I need to redefine it. I need to pick something that will absolutely unambiguously mean me. You know, it won't have any associations, it won't have anything like that. But, you know, that's short and it's not my real name and I can just use this on every service. And so I, I went through four letter combinations that I liked that, you know, none of the letters were ambiguous, none of them were the I or the L that you can't tell apart in sans serif fonts. Um, and I finally hit on XKCD and I registered as a screen name, domain name. And the idea was it would mean unambiguously me. And then I went and ruined that by using it on my webcomic. So now it doesn't even mean me anymore. <laughs> So my original purpose was foiled, but I ended up with a kind of cool name. So anyone else? Next. There is back there. Yes. Thank you. What's up? Um, <laughs> all right. How much money do you actually make doing this? And how can a brother get in on making all that sweet cash for drawing stick figures, for Christ's sake? I mean, no offense, it's great, but seriously, I don't know how much they pay you, but it's probably too much, brother. I love you. you, you got... Hey, you, you guys are the ones buying the t-shirts. No, um, for getting in on this, my recommendation is make a joke about a Linux command. Apparently that plays really, really well. Like, I didn't even, I didn't see that the, the pseudo strip was like probably the most gain that we've had in one day. Although this recent SQL one is maybe competing with it. <laughs> but that was like the entire internet showed up in, over the course of 24 hours. And I, I did not see that coming at all. <laughs> like, I was like, okay, I like the strip. And then everyone. So I don't understand it either. But it's... <laughs> I, my, my advice though, I think... I, I think the real trick is just something that... <sighs> this always happens everywhere I go. <laughs> Raptors. Does anyone have a super soaker? <laughs> <laughs> no, apparently, um, I mean, the news every day is that the raptors were more and more like birds than, you know, reptiles, which I can only say in the form of a Jurassic Park quote. I do this, like, uh, when Sam Neill was explaining to the kid about raptors, and he said, you know, maybe raptors had more in, more in common with modern-day birds than they do in with reptiles, and... That was, that was in 1983, and that has only become more and more true. And every now and then there's a news story saying, you know, oh, it turns out raptors had feathers. And, you know, that news story will go around, or, you know, it turns out this kind of dinosaur was like this. So every time one of those hits the wire and then circles around, I get email. <laughs> I get lots and lots and lots and lots of email. I think I had something like... 80 emails about the last time there was, a, there was a little CNN story about raptors having feathers. And I had 80 different people saying, hey, I don't know if you saw this, but... And I'm like, I, I promise I am more up on raptor news than you. I follow these things. I have, I, I have all the RSS feeds. Raptor blog. You know, maybe we need that. So... Uh, next question. Yes. Where's the Velociraptor entry point for Siebel Center? Okay, well, I saw large, like, panes of glass. And that's the first thing. Because, like, you can shut doors and stuff, and doors are generally, you know, the, the, especially outside doors tend to be a little bit solid, but glass, like there was the one scene in the movie where, you know, oh, we shut the door and they're safe, and then the raptor came through the glass. So my thing, whenever I walked into a room when I was a kid, I would, I, or like into a new house, I would always look for what room does not have large outside windows. <laughs> so that's the key. Now here, um, the th so I came in here and I'm realizing, okay, there isn't, you know, there's some exit doors here, but they look like they have keypads, and I don't know, maybe you can't open those. Generally, fire codes let you get out, but when you get out, 
what do you find? More raptors, because it's outside. And then it occurs to me, right now, I'm, I'm surrounded by several hundred people, probably not all of whom can run as fast as me. <laughs> so I think my strategy changes. <laughs> Don't have to outrun the raptor, just have to outrun you. So, yes, a uh, question up there. What's the geographical distribution of your readership? Um, Google. <laughs> it's basically we'll have pockets of, um, of intense, you know, there will be a huge flow of readers. And it's hard to keep track of those. We've got some geo IP statistics. But it looks like, like, 40% of the traffic is generated, you know, I mean, not 40%, but, you know, some huge percentage of the traffic is from MIT and the Google campus. Microsoft is further down on the list, so I wonder if that uh, tells you something about the corporate culture. Maybe it means Microsoft gets work done. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, and, and so there are, you know, it's, it's basically English language places. There's someone actually trying on tra uh, Spanish translations of the site of all of the comics, which you can get to through es.xkcd.com, which isn't very well known. But... I mean, they have to be unofficial translations because humor is so language dependent. Like, I can't vouch for whether or not it's at all faithful or even has the same joke. But, so it's basically English language countries. U.S., the parts of Canada that aren't angry about, that, you know, aren't vocal about French, and Australia and the U.K. And in the U.S., it's the Bay Area, the Northeast Corridor, and then random little pockets of insanely technical people in the Midwest. <laughs> I mean, because I think this room, this is, this is about as many people as we got at MIT. So apparently you guys are pretty awesome here. <laughs> so uh, I imagine that you get a lot of repetitive questions. You go everywhere and people want to ask you about raptors and who reads the comic and that kind of thing. What's been your most unexpected questions that you've received? Oh, that's... That is a cheater question. That's a meta question. I don't know if you can do that. <laughs> Um, I think actually the, the most unexpected question I got was uh, a very nice lady who, wrote, who actually wrote to me with the question, do you know anything about the mechanics of time, in all caps? <laughs> and uh, apparently, and, and she had had some, uh, you know, experience with the sun moving fast and... Uh, spheres of energy and items in her backpack being rearranged and it, it, she had this this whole this whole story for her and her friend and you know she was like I'm trying not to be too weird about this it just you know we observed this we weren't on any drugs so can science explain and I was like no <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I mean she was just, she was like I want to talk to someone scientifically minded who can maybe help me figure this out and I was like well that's good um you talked about items being rearranged in your knapsack. We can do that. Uh, there's the knapsack problem. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, you know, try to get some pictures next time. But, so I think that, I mean, she, she wrote back, she was, you know, very nice about it. So I think, but that was definitely one of the weirder, all caps, mechanics of time. No. So, okay, all up there. So uh, what inspired the uh, fuck computational linguistics one? <laughs> have, have you met a computational linguist? Is that, is that you? There's a few around. <laughs> well, to any uh, computational linguists here, um, fuck you guys, first of all. <laughs> I don't know. No, um, I like to poke fun, poke fun at sort of like the ends of, you know, science and academia that are a little bit more, that seem like th it's more theories that aren't so much falsifiable that easily. And I feel like a lot of the stuff I've looked at with language, it'll just be like, okay, here's a big overarching theory. Here's a big overarching theory that has a completely different structure and, you know, suggests different ideas. And both of them could be true. Like, it seems like there needs to be more experiment there. But of course, I'm not up on the literature, and from talking to some occasionally angry computational linguists, <laughs> I've learned that, you know, at the higher levels, it is a little bit more rigorous. 
but I mean that's that's still just you know in like the you know mathematical field and the, the computational and the scientific field you know they might be that sort of like language stuff might be over toward the flaky end, you know the the, the flaky end a little bit more like the the less basically the um, the further away from physics end I don't know the way I see it is you like in in academia you start off it's like this scale you start off over here with well literary criticism <laughs> and then you move up the scale in how serious they are <laughs> to like you know then then psychology where at least you know you've got people and then <laughs> and you know the people you you can poke them with a stick and they do things and then you've got like the more cognitive and neuropsych where you can poke them with a stick and then use a computer and you know they do things and then it goes further up into just like you know straight up biology and that's a little bit more serious and then biology is all based on chemistry and then with chemistry ultimately is based on physics and so those of us who are physics majors just sort of got to stand here at the end and you know look down on everyone else but and and then the math majors would come up from over here it's like oh what are you doing and shoo <laughs> and so computational linguists and computer programmers I sort of feel are hovering around it's like math but they've branched off you know and it's it sort of has a practical side to it so it's just along another dimension on the graph somewhere but they're up at the they're still up in the serious end of like math and computer science and stuff so I'll, I'll, I guess I guess I should say you know fuck you guys but at least you're not literary critics <laughs> so who's got it now yes Okay. Um, have you ever edited your own Wikipedia entry? <laughs> I can't lie about this. The logs are there. <laughs> well, at least maybe they won't recognize my username. It's cleverly disguised as XKCD. Ha! Citation needed. Oh, sweet, more of them. What about Wikiscanner? <laughs> What's this? Oh. What about Wikiscanner? You're going to get caught. So I edited, I edited the entry very early on when there was, it had like first gone up and there were a few things in there that you know, weren't quite right or were missing some stuff, and I edited them. But then I sort of made a post on the uh, discussion page saying, OK, you know, this is the conflict of interest thing, so I won't edit this anymore. I'll just notice that something's wrong and hint very strongly to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> You know, for a while it had it listing that I started the comic in May 2005, and I remember it being September 2005, but you know, on, on the other hand, this is Wikipedia, so <laughs> maybe they know better than me, I don't know. <laughs> so I've been tempted there. I think that's, that's been changed. There are also some places where something will get referred to in Wikipedia, and then it will get echoed in some other source, like someone else will mention it, as, you know, and then Wikipedia will cite that source. <laughs> this happened, um, the, uh, you know, minor details like nomenclature. There's, there's a comic, there were the five comics early on that I did about the boy in the barrel. And I had always called him barrel, like the boy in the barrel, or I think maybe in one of the alt texts or something, barrel boy. But Wikipedia decided he was called barrel lad. And, and he was, and it, they referred to him as like a named character, you know, quote, barrel lad. And I was like, well, and, and I mean, you know, far be it from me doing computer science to be picky about naming conventions, but, <laughs> but, uh, and, and that sort of, you know, irked me for a little while, especially then when it would get like repeated somewhere else. They'd say, oh, he's called Barrel Lad, and then Wikipedia would, could then cite that. And so there you've got the wikiality where just, just citations aren't enough. But overall, I've been happy with Wikipedia. I think that a lot of people mischaracterize it. Um, they like try to compare it to Britannica, but I don't know anyone who carries around Britannica in like a handheld thing as, to augment their brain. <laughs> I feel, uh, I mean, I feel like I, I don't learn things in as much depth because I know that Wikipedia is right over there. So like, there's no, it, it's like there isn't as much use in memorizing, you know, tables of things or knowing, you know, how fast can this kind of bird fly. 
because if you need that knowledge, you've just trans it's just being held by Wikipedia. Of course, if you've got part of your brain in Wikipedia, you also have not just malicious vandalism, but the more fun vandalism. <laughs> One of my favorites is Ryan North, who does dinosaur comics, which is a great comic, despite the fact that it's written by a computational linguist. <laughs> <clears throat> I think my favorite Wikipedia prank was where he had them change uh, <clears throat> all instances of evil to Irish evil. <laughs> <coughs> and I went to the pages and, it w and I went to the page on evil and it said, you know, like, Irish evil has been with us for centuries. <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately, I feel like Wikipedia's error rate is not the defining factor in how useful it is. Like, they say it has a comparable error rate to Britannica or something like that, but I feel like even if it had a 10 times higher error rate, that's still not a huge amount of errors, and it's still useful for just, I want to know how fast this bird flies, you know? And, that, and that's what we use it for. Like, nine times out of 10 is just trying to get some brief perspective on something. So I'm in favor of Wikipedia. So who has the mic now? Back there. Right. Are you secretly running wetriffs.com? <laughs> it was... You could maybe say secretly up until we put up the pictures a little bit ago. And there I, I said, you know, okay, I drew this comic and I've set up this site. Yes, I did. I set it up because, and if anyone wants to check the registration time on that and then compare it to when the comic went up, you'll find it was actually registered about six months beforehand. <laughs> because I have been planning, I had decided very early on that we needed guitar in the shower porn. And I just had to figure out a way to make it happen. And the, the results were wonderful. I especially like um, at the end, there was the guy who, I don't, I don't think he took this picture for Wet Rift specifically, but he submitted it where it was uh, the guy with the guitar, you know, naked with the guitar and boots, I think, and a, uh, an, a machine gun and a, t and a tomahawk and a goblet. <laughs> and that's one of the best pictures to come out of the internet, I think. <laughs> because that guy is prepared. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, if we had Web 2.0 here or whatever it is, I could probably throw the picture up, but unfortunately. Um, but, no, but he, I was thinking like a picture like that, I don't know how many of you have seen it or what am I talking about? You all have laptops here. You can all look at it. Um, but this, this picture of, I was deciding it needed a lolcat caption. And, but I was thinking like, you, you know, what would this be? You know, I'm in your base. Th this is not going well for you. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen, but this is going to be bad. He has a guitar and a machine gun. Yeah, if anyone, anyone with laptops can pull it up and show it around. I am not exaggerating. I am not doing this picture justice. <laughs> so, so who has the mic up there? Um, on the <laughs> bottom of your page, um, under the recommended reading, there's like some really small unreadable script, and if you copy and paste it onto another document, you can read what it says. And it's about like the algorithm and Jesus and a bunch of other stuff. And I was just wondering, what exactly uh, were you thinking about that, and like what is it? That I can probably. That was a, a a project a little while ago. I noticed that there are uh, that when I was dr the question is about this. So there's this text on the bottom of xkc.com that has a few lines like uh, the the algorithm was banned in China. The algorithm killed Jeeves. The algorithm uh, consistently or constantly finds Jesus and and you know these very these lines. What happened was I was driving through New York. And I noticed these billboards that were just, you know, solid color, and in the middle it would say, it would say one of those lines: "The algorithm killed the algorithm killed Jeeves. The algorithm is banned in China. The algorithm is from Jersey," with no explanation of what they're about. And I went home and Googled them and found only a couple of results, which were other people wondering, "What are these billboards about?" <laughs> and and it was, I was thinking, you know. 
people who are into puzzles, so this, was, this is clearly a viral marketing campaign of some kind, but it's a viral marketing campaign, you know, and, and uh, it turned out it was by ask.com, the, the site formerly Ask Jeeves. And I was thinking, you know, you've got these people who, like, who, who are going to go home and Google that and try to figure it out. I think that's the sort of person who would like XKCD. <laughs> so we set this up to, um, and, and we got, we put it up on the forums, and I think on the uh, XKCD blag, to blag, <laughs> um, to, and just got people to link to it. And it didn't take all that many links before we were the top Google result for <laughs> every one of those phrases. I, I just. <laughs> I thought it was cool, cause, and, it, and I, I felt a little guilty, but it, it was neat. Someone had spent you know, a fair bit of money to set up these billboards and try to play games with people, and we hijacked it. <laughs> and so that's what that's about. And I think um, the billboards may have, came, may have come down by now. Maybe it didn't work out the way they had hoped. I don't know. <laughs> so... So uh, we'll probably take that text off there. But I like leaving it there, too, just for the, the sort of person who would, you know, look at that text and blow it up and expand it, just confuse them a little bit. So who now? Yes? What area of the country would you say has the best trees for the ultimate treehouse? Oh, man. Um, there's, well, like, the West Coast has the really tall, you know, more of the redwood sequoia types. But I feel like the ultimate treehouse, like if you've seen Swiss Family Robinson, really needs to have branches, like going way, way out. So you can have like room here and then room up on the branches and room up there. And I'm not, I figure it's going to be somewhere more tropical. But because I've, I've uh, that's the only place I've seen really good trees like that. So I'm not sure, but I've, I've seen, since I drew that, I've gotten, I've had some people send me pictures of treehouses that people have built. So it's been done. If you Google like ultimate treehouse, you might find something. You can work out what area it's from, what area there. I tried building it behind my house in Massachusetts when I was eight, and that didn't work out too well. We, I mean, I got like one slab of plywood nestled in the branches, and that, that's as far as I got with that. But I still have all the blueprints, and one of these days, <laughs> it's gonna have like a helicopter landing pad on top. So, who's, no. yes? You, I know in a few of your comics here you have a guy from the internet, and I've always wondered why you've had him have a top hat. What is the reasoning behind this? The top hat guy, um, it's like one of, the, one of the few places where I've got like a, a thing to define a character when it's still pretty, I like the, uh, the fact that the, peop the stick figures you know, can pretty much be anyone, you know, they're not really well defined, and I think that works well for the comic. Uh, because you know, it's, it's like the way Dilbert's boss isn't named, it's so you can better imagine him as your own boss. But I like ways to sort of, I was, I w the idea was I would split them off a little bit into like this kind of guy and this kind of guy, and the guy with the top hat is the one that I use when I want to be an asshole and don't want it to reflect too badly on me. <laughs> So I, it, I like displace that all into this top hat guy, and he just goes and like smashes in people's windows when they're being obnoxious. And the hat th I, I use the hat for him. It was actually because uh, there was a comic called Men in Hats, which was very small run, w w you know, back in the day, which I loved dearly, and it had an asshole character with a black hat. So I that just seemed like the natural symbol for someone who's just being a an asshole, but you know, happy about it. A very jovial asshole. <laughs> yes. Okay, two things. First of all, I like the way that you've concentrated your insults right here. I've got a, a computational linguist and a literary critic. <laughs> and uh, second of all, uh, you, you obviously put forth sort of your own strong um, philosophy, if you will, through your comic. So I'm going to leave this question is open-ended as possible. What do you think needs to change? <laughs> what do I think needs to change? I 
I think better door locks, and we need to get rid of those handles that you could turn with claws. <laughs> And I think maybe that one scene where, uh, in, in, where you have to n navigate through this uh, 3D Unix system, apparently, and <laughs> click on the right building to close the door, I don't think that's very efficient. <laughs> I like, though, that uh, if anyone remembers that scene in Jurassic Park where she's closing the door you know, by navigating through this, and she's you know, like, oh, this is a Unix system. I know this. And everyone's like, what is that? That's not a Unix system. And it, it, it actually is a visualization that uh, a visualization system, this interface, that was built and was used a little bit. So that was actually real. It wasn't just movie effects, you know. So, yes? Back, going back earlier to what you said about the mechanics of time, uh, what do you uh, think about the morality of time travel? Well, I don't think that you should uh, go back in time and kill your grandfather. You know what? Actually, no. Um, I don't think you should go back in time and kill my grandfather. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting how when H.G. Wells wrote The Time Machine, he had to spend, like, I, I haven't read the book, but um, that he had to spend I, something like, you know, 100 pages just explaining what a time machine was that it's something that we sort of get this now. You know, there's, oh, there are time machines. You know, the different kind of time machines, as South Park pointed out, there are the Terminator rules ones and the uh, Back to the Future rules and so on. But the, it, that idea doesn't, like, naturally make sense to people. It's something you have to learn through seeing it a bunch of times. Like the idea that you move back in time, that time moves backward for everyone else and you stand still, or maybe it's you move backward in time, you know, there are a bunch of different ways of looking at it, and it leads to these paradoxes. And like overall, my opinion on time travel is that it's not too well thought out an idea in terms of uh, like internal consistency. But I, the one thing that is possible is traveling forward in time. And with the aid of certain substances, traveling forward in time really fast. <laughs> I think that's also the scenic route. <laughs> so... I kind of like that idea of you know, getting frozen and jumping forward in time 100 years and checking things out there, seeing if they've worked out how to deal with comment spam, you know. <laughs> the blogs of the future. It's going to be grand. So uh, one more. Who's, we'll get another. Some of your themes on human interaction and romance, like the one about writing a script to make the screen stay on in Linux during a movie, have a sort of been there, done that feel to them. And uh, I was curious, where do you get your material for this stuff? Is it, is it your own experience? <laughs> <coughs> so that one, I actually had that problem with Ubuntu. Where it, and it's been, fix, it's been fixed in the, one of the later versions. Where, but on you know, my particular configuration, my machine, it would, even when you turned off power saving, the screen would still power down after 10 minutes. And it was a huge problem for watching movies. And eventually, I, and I did have an incident like that. At the time, I had a little bit more foresight and we moved the movie out to the living room and just watched it on, we had a DVD player, I think, and we just watched it over there. But after she had left, I sat down and I was like, if I want to do this again, and so I got mouse macro stuff and made a script that every 10 minutes w or every you know, five minutes would flip the mouse one pixel to the left, one pixel to the right. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> that was not an exaggeration at all. That, that part actually works as a solution. That, it's also, that's the reason that I'm not a programmer because that sort of thing seems perfectly good to me. <laughs> I'm... Um, I, like I've, I've written some code for you know various fun little projects. I have one one piece of code that goes over recent live journal posts, pulls out random English sentences from them, uh, you know parses them to pull out sentences. I uh, not computational lingu linguistics, <laughs> nothing like that, but you know going over the sentences, finding the you know where that where they start and end, and then looks for interesting words, and then just prints a scrolling feed of that. 
you know, like every entry mentioning nipples. You know, anytime someone's talking, says like nipple, they're probably talking about something interesting. So, you know, <laughs> what I've been really working on is I want to get a Bayesian filter set up to like track interest, words that indicate interesting entries. You know, like whenever, so, if someone's mentioning velociraptors, that's probably interesting. Or, you know, astroglide, that's going to be an interesting story. <laughs> Or, God forbid, the two together. <laughs> so, and I, I'm looking at getting that set up because I think that would be fun. Um, you could then get it hooked into like tons and tons of RSS feeds. and it would, it would be like IRC highlights, you know, on certain words, except it would just be on anything intriguing. TMI would be another good one. Like, anytime someone says TMI, I always feel like, no, no, you, you, were, you were at just the right level there. <laughs> Like the, ah, uh, uh, yeah, it's like um, like meta quotes and the overheard in New York and stuff like that. That's um, I I noticed that they had a list of most subscribed live journal feeds, and I was like, oh man, I'm so far down on that list. And so I actually have the I for a very long time I had a link to the live journal feed on my um, on the bottom of the page along with like links to the RSS feed and stuff. And so, you know, it's sort of that inflates my numbers a little bit because everyone who's on LiveJournal and reading the comic, you know, who notices that would friend the feed, which has now led to it being like disproportionately, I think it's like the fifth most friended entity on LiveJournal. <laughs> and, you know, th which is like out of proportion to the actual readership. But I, I mention this because one, the, one of the four beating us is the, I think, I think overheard in New York, or we might have we just passed that one. But another one is the Neil Gaiman's journal, which is also really widely read. So he's, he's the next to go. <laughs> also, okay, do you think if something happened to him, people would unfriend his feed? Like, it, you know, if he was no longer updating for some reason? Maybe I should get off the internet for a while. <sighs> so, yes. Cool. There we go. Do you have an elliptical reflector dish? <laughs> you know, that was one of the strips. Um, you know, my mom reads my comic. <laughs> and, and, you know, she's, she's always been very good about this. It's like, a, I think it's a good parental arrangement where your parents will snoop in on all the stuff you're doing, but pretend not to and can never mention anything to you about it. So you can pretend they're not reading it and everyone's happy. <laughs> Except maybe your parents when they read your stuff. But, and that was one of the ones where I, I got a note, uh, you know, an email in the morning saying, by the way, I think, you know, from my mom saying, I think that, that was, that, that was one of your funniest comics, with the caveat that, of course, I'm sure none of it is from personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, I do not, no, I have, what I have are the tools to lay out an elliptical dish, so, should the, uh, the situation present itself. <laughs> but I actually had, for doing the comic, I had to track down some string and some push pins and draw, to draw an ellipse. Uh, you know, you, you put down the two push pins and you put down the, you wrap a, spool, a, a, a ring of string around it and then use a pen and you can use that to do the, the ellipse. The sum of the two distances are equal from the two centers at every point. And it, it's interesting because you'd think that I would just, you know, use the computer for that. <laughs> It's funny that, the, that my comic is one of the more like, tech-heavy ones, and I'm also one of the more low-tech like, comic drawing operations. I'm one of the very few people doing a webcomic who still does them by hand. Like, I mean, he still does the uh, lettering by hand, which is also kind of strange because I c the one class I consistently failed in school was handwriting. <laughs> and I'm going to hear my actual handwriting. Oh, is this focused? Can we... Oh well. So, you know, I letter this comic, and, and you can see in some of the earlier comics, before I like started lettering a lot more carefully, my actual handwriting <laughs> that is how I write. And now I'm a professional letterer. 
so that was sort of an interesting turn. And I, I, I almost want to go back to like the, the grade school teachers who would give me like those bad grades in handwriting. And just, ha! <laughs> but personally, for, personally, I blame cursive for ruining everyone's handwriting. Like we started off doing the nice printed letters, you know, big, you know, the big red dog. And then they taught us cursive. And now everyone, and then when, like when everyone reaches adulthood, they go back to some sort of bizarre hybrid of print and cursive and it just looks like this scrawl. And uh, I have no idea what the original question was. Where did we start? <laughs> <laughs> that was, um, <clears throat> but I do have strong opinions on cursive. So at least we ended up somewhere good. So, and who has it now? Oh, back there. Hey, uh, what are your favorite and most hated Linux distros? <laughs> I don't, I don't want to make any enemies here, so I'll just say <laughs> I hate Mandrake and <laughs> feel... <laughs> Okay, so we've heard from the one Mandrake user here. <laughs> or uh, Mandriva, or you know, whatever it's called these days. Now that, that's the one I started out on, and when I started out on it, they were using RPM. And I just remember this horrible experience of installing software in Linux is easy. Here's the RPM manual. And I, and I would look down at it and it would say, okay, you know, here's... And, and like the whole idea is also kind of weird, installing soft, you know, like from the repositories when you're used to download an executable and it self-inflates. But... Now, I, now, on my home machines, I use Ubuntu. And I really like installing through the package manager, at least when it works. But, OK, every machine in my apartment except um, shameful confession. Here, I have the machine that I do the comics on. And it is running Windows. So I always feel really guilty when someone who meets me, who's like knows me through the comic, meets me and then sees that. And I feel like there's like, they die a little inside or, you know. It's <laughs> <clears throat> like, oh, you're so cool, you. Oh, Windows, huh? Well, that, that's, you know, that's okay. I've, we all have our, our stuff to get through. But no, I mean, I, I, I use it for Photoshop and occasionally games. So... It really, Windows is, it's fairly straightforward and something goes wrong and I reinstall it. And I feel like <clears throat> as long as I keep Vista off of it, I'm at least a little bit better, you know? So I'll, I will have XP for the foreseeable future and then eventually probably migrate over to some kind of Linux after everything, after I can find a way to avoid using the GIMP. <laughs> because I tried that for a while. Everyone's like, oh, it's a Photoshop alternative. It lets you do, you know, all of the same stuff. And I tried it and it was just horrible. Like, I even got GIMP Shop to make it work like Photoshop. And it would still take me, like, two hours to do something, and nothing acted intuitive. And so I moved away from that and moved back to doing everything on Windows, doing all the comic stuff on Windows, and not sleeping well at night. <laughs> I could do a Mac. I don't know. Um, the other thing that I need is Battlefield 1942. <laughs> is, is that... they? Have, I don't need any of this newfangled stuff. <laughs> uh, no, um, well, Battlefield 1942, this is a random plug. I'm not sponsored or anything, but Fujitsu Lifebooks are, you know, some of the more awesome machines I've played with. So this one is one of those. I saw one of these, you know, back when I was in school and my professor had one. And I was like, oh, that is so cool. It would, you know, cost a lot. But it would, it would be a neat thing to have someday in theory. And now it has a touch screen. So I can, you know, so I can do, com and I do comic editing on it. Business expense. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you yeah, know, as for favorite uh, Linux distribution, I'm going with Ubuntu. I think that that's the one that ever, if, I feel like if Ubuntu isn't right for you, you already know because you're already running Gentoo or whatever. So, you know, for everyone else who's looking at one of them, it, it basically just works. I, although I've been on Slashdot long enough, I can't say it'll be ready for the desktop in five years because it's been a good seven or eight years of that now. So, but it, it's, 
like in the last two or three releases, it's gone from like you will have one or two problems that you need someone really experienced to solve to you might not have any, which is definitely on par. I mean, that's definitely past Windows 98, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Actually, did anyone see the ads uh, when Vista came out? They had the ad campaign, and their tagline was "The Wow Starts Now," and Apple ran. You know, Apple sort of saw this, let that go for a while to everyone who heard that, and then ran a campaign that just had the OSX logo, and it said, the wow started five years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, yeah, score one for Apple there. I think Apple is doing good things. I actually had someone stop me on a train and ask me about what I thought about Steve Jobs' upcoming Conquering of the World. And whether or not, like, you know, going into politics and, and, uh, and so forth, this was not an XKCD reader. This was someone walking up and down the train talking to people. <laughs> you know, she, she didn't know who I was. She was just trying to find someone who wanted to talk to her about the, how the military runs the Internet and, I mean, Facebook, yeah, but not the Internet. <laughs> and, but I think my, my thing with Apple is they... They, have, they are actually caring about user interface, which is, like, caring at all about user interface is a huge step up from everything else in engineering. Like, if there's one thing that I think we could drastically improve, it's train people in making interfaces usable, and specifically making them usable for someone who is not an engineer who is working on the project and knows its ins and outs. <laughs> you know, like, I'm a fan of a visual metaphor when you make it work, which is different from, I mean, like, there's Microsoft Bob. You know, you can go. The, you can go wrong with that, but <clears throat> so I, like the iPod. You know, you can pick it up and you know how to do it immediately, like a series of fairly complicated things. So, I think that's really the big thing that needs to be changing. That needs to happen in the next, you know, ten or fifteen years is not so much technology jumping forward, but interfaces that let us use the technology we already have to do these cool things. And again, I think that started with a question somewhere, but you know. That's, that's in the past. We can't go backward. So, yes? So you know what would be really cool to hang from the sky? Mm. A swing. <laughs> Man. I have read, and if you go through the history on Wikipedia, you can find probably proof of this, because this is, and as a, first of all, as a side note, if anyone finds a writer who has a Wikipedia entry, or has a, I mean who has a Wikipedia uh, user who they stay logged in as, you can track exactly what they're thinking about, because you will find that they read these entries and they will fix typos obsessively. Like, it's like a compulsion. And, and so you could get like a portrait of whatever they're researching for their next book or the next comic because you know they'll be writing a you know science fiction author writing about Jupiter and you'll see a bunch of edits to the Jupiter article fixing the it apostrophe s thing, you know. <clears throat> so you can find that if you go back into my history, there is a Wikipedia article on human lifting kites, <laughs> and I have read this article and read the references. Because basically people did this back at, toward the beginning of the century, the 20th century, and, you know, back in the day. The, and they, they did man lifting kites, and then sort of hang gliders took over, and that really took the attention away, and like people just did hang gliding then. But I think there, there's some folks uh, where I live now who have a kite hooked up, that they can hook up to like a surfboard, and it's this, you know, big uh, 9 or 12 square meter kite that and you can hold on, and it has a harness and everything. And I, I want to take that to the next level, you know, double or triple the size again. Still under five pounds somehow. And, <laughs> and get it so you actually can hang from the string. So that'll also be an awesome project. You'll need, you'll need more of the deep sea fishing line, like the really strong stuff. The stuff I have right now is a breaking strength of about 130 pounds. So, and especially at that angle, you know, it's going to be tough. But... I think it can be done. So I think that's a good project. Here's, here's another project that I have been wanting to do for a while, which is to find like 
a bridge or something, get a pulley, and another pulley, you know, maybe here. So, you know, you've got, a, like, maybe this is over, like, some kind of a gorge. You've you got to find somewhere where there's, like, a couple hundred feet up. You get this rope. You get a person hanging from one of those stage harnesses. And here, you have 95% of their weight. So what it would basically, you know, that, that would drop you to 5% gravity, you know, effectively. And so, you know, if you can normally jump a couple feet into the air, you would now be able to just jump and, like, soar 20 or 30 feet. If you have this be long enough, then the person can, like, go sideways without much restoring force. So it would really just be like you could fly around. <laughs> In theory. I haven't tried this. Um, <laughs> but see, what I think, what I really want to do with this like, this is just the, the uh, you know, the medium to work in. But then what you do is you get another couple people here. You know, going to a similar thing. You give them lightsabers. Tell me that wouldn't be incredibly fun. Like, you could actually do, like, the flip over the person while, you know, light, lightsabering down at them. And you could also y give, do, like, the laser tag guns and then pull an actual battle room from Ender's Game, where... And, you know, so people would... people And, you, and you'd have, like, you know, you'd start off over here, and they'd, you know, start off over here, and you'd then, like, soar among each other. And... And you could get an advantage because they'd be thinking of down as here. And you'd be thinking of down as here. <laughs> because the enemy's gate is down. We need a gate. I want to give this diagram to, you know, some engineers or something without any explanation. <laughs> and then say, like, this here is the key. <laughs> and, and just see what they make of that. So we'll do uh, a couple more questions and then a little bit more drawing. What's, does anyone have the mic now? Oh, right here, actually. You That's okay. So softball and football. Those are those outside team sports, right? <laughs> I, I might not have emphasized the internet thing er, enough earlier. <laughs> but no, I, I, I didn't connect the kite thing to Charles Schultz, uh, partially because I never, I, I uh, learned early on how to get a kite up, which is, and, and this is something like, I, I want to go back. Um, so there's the theme in, in comics and a lot of humor of just like inevitable tragedy or, you know, making that funny, like everything turns out badly. And, you know, Charlie Brown can never get his kite in the air. You know, he's always running with it. And I just, like, I, and I understand how it's, you know, represents this and it, but I just can't be that down constantly. Like, I, I want to go back and just shake him and say, like, let out the string, like, 100 feet and then start running and it'll get up and get in the wind and it'll stay up. You can't keep a kite up really low running along. <laughs> and also, she's going to pull the football away. <laughs> So, but no, peanuts is wonderful, especially um, 
I read comics. I read comic strips obsessively. Not so much comic books, but that's what I did through high school. Was I read like, first of all, every Calvin and Hobbes strip, multiple times. <laughs> When I was 14, you could give me the opening line to every Calvin and Hobbes, any Calvin and Hobbes strip, and I could tell you the rest of the strip verbatim. Just because I would like pick it up and read, oh, this is funny. And then, you know, pick it up again, read, it's still funny, hey. <laughs> you know, and I would just, uh, also, I'm so absent-minded that like every time it was like reading them again, you know. <laughs> and so I did the same thing with, I, I did that with Garfield. I read every single Garfield strip up to collection 31, I think. Um, that was middle school again, but you know, still. And there, were, there was some good Garfield back in the day. But, uh, you know, Dilbert, uh, nowadays Get Fuzzy and Zitz and the Boondocks. Um, and no one has read every Peanuts strip because he wrote for 50 years, like one a day with basically no sabbaticals. I don't think he's even read every Peanuts strip. You know? <laughs> but, but I've read, all, you know, I would read a lot of those. And I never really put it together, like, until basically in hindsight that... I spent my childhood reading humor and doing math. Re you know, so I, those were like my big things. I was read humor, do math, you know, humor, math, humor, and math. And then, whoa, how did I end up drawing comics about math? <laughs> and all of a sudden it becomes clear, which is actually a really, really important lesson. Um, this is something Steve Jobs has actually talked about a lot. When, when he was at school, you know, for the, uh, he got, he dropped out eventually, and he would still attend classes that he thought sounded fun. You know, just show up and no one would kick him out. One of the things he attended, though, was a calligraphy class. And he, he uh, there was no real reason for this. Like, it, it didn't advance him in any way. He wasn't going to do, you know, handwriting. You know, he wasn't going to do calligraphy. But he was like, this seems kind of interesting. And so he'd do it. And it seemed, you know, it seemed frivolous. But... Then, when he started working at Apple, and they started doing word processing, that's basically the reason why Apple was the first one to do variable width fonts. Because he recognized, like, oh, the type, typefaces are important. You know, it's not just get the letters out there in fixed width. So that's why, you know, Apple got a head start on the fixed width fonts, and they got, then that got them a head start on graphics. And that's why they're now the computer for graphics work. And, you know, contributes hugely to their success. So, and, and the important lesson from there, and the important lesson that I got from, you know, the fact that I read comic strips all day, and then it became useful, is that you can never put together what's going to be important ahead of time. And, y like, career planning is, it'll, like, deny you more opportunities than it'll add. What the important thing to do is to do something that's, in to do something that's interesting and to actually do things. And then it'll put itself together somehow. Like, so I think that like, everyone changes majors in college and you know, no one's sure what they want to do and they feel like, okay, I have to commit to something even if I'm selecting it somewhat at random. But it's, I think it's really better to not know what you want to do but to do things, just to try things at random. And sooner or later it'll come together in the end. So that's you know, my helpful life lesson. And now we can go back to, you know, Fuck you, computational linguists. <laughs> so, um, let's see, we'll get another question uh, back up there. Um, I noticed you do a lot of Pearl in this comics, kind of like the uh, Robert Frost parody comic you did a little while ago. Um, what's your preferred language? So, I mentioned earlier how I was talking about the, uh, the live journal reader, which the, the thing that goes over and pulls out interesting lines from a live journal and so forth. And I've, I write other code, but the reason I'm not a serious programmer is because all of those are one-line, 300-character Perl scripts. <laughs> you know, I start off with like, okay, here's a line that does what I want. What if I add this feature? What if I add this feature? You know, I could, I could indent this all and lay it out right. I don't know. That seems like work. So I end up with these monstrosities in, like, barely working Perl. Lisp looks so, so pretty, you know. And, and the, peop the way people talk about it is sort of, it, it's like the, the Hare Krishna, you know, mildly freakish evangelism. But 
Yeah, I mean, I talk to people who are like Lisp is, I, I asked um, some of my T folks, what, you know, what do you think programming language is in the future? You know, what, where's the direction it's going? Is it this object orientation? Is it stuff like Python? What? And they were like, Lisp. It's really like languages feel like they're moving more and more toward it. And there's a quote, uh, every language contains within it a half, like, half-baked, half-put-together, shoddily implemented version of common Lisp. And it's just no one knows that that's what they're trying to use. So basically, Lisp sounds good. In real life, I use Perl. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in both cases, it's really more a matter of necessity. So, and uh, is the microphone floated anywhere? All right, do this. How often do you think about making out with yourself? <laughs> I had gotten most of the day until this question. <laughs> That's another interesting thing on Wikipedia is that they list like um, running themes in the comics, and they'll list anything that's been mentioned twice. <laughs> and so they have Mussolini as a running theme, and I happen to have like two punchlines that involved him. But um, and the, the same for making out with yourself. And they uh, fortunately, someone you know in the talk page was like, as far as I can tell, there are just two references to it. Is this really a running theme? Unfortunately, I actually said in the alt text, I think this should be a running XKCD theme. So. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, um, actually, going back to moral uses of time travel. <laughs> <coughs> I'd like to revise my opinion a little bit. No, uh, who's, where is it now? Any All questions? Right. So, your, uh, the title given to you today was President of the Internet. Why not uh, Supreme Emperor or Benevolent Dictator? Because I certainly don't remember voting for you. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, I, I think that the programming community sort of you know, has this eye towards standards. And you, know, you have RFCs to establish things. And it occurred to me, there is no body that claim that uh, that holds you know, the authority to standardize the office president of the internet. So I decided, hey, does that mean that I can just pull a president, uh, a, an Emperor Norton here and just declare it and have it become a de facto standard? So I'm giving that a try. I think that um, I can be the president of the internet. As long as I'm not too specific about what my powers are at first, um, you know, I can... Uh, <laughs> You know, maybe people will like humor me with that and accept it, and then eventually it'll start getting written in places. I'll get referred to it formally, and then I start exercising dictatorial control. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, I could have MySpace shut down in the night by Men in Black. <laughs> and right now, I think what I'm going to start with is a. Uh, a document outlining standards for, pro, for for very minor things like programming comments. I've seen some people who already use the uh, the standard in Perl. Every time you use the chomp command, you follow it with a comment that says nom nom nom. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to encourage everyone to make that a standard. I think that I think that it, it should fail like as someone pointed out. It should fail strict checking if you don't use that. <laughs> And then, and then we should just start adding more jokes. And then, like every time you embed a call to say Perl inside Lisp, you have to like add a comment saying "I'm sorry." <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll, we'll just get a bunch of those and just make it make an actual RFC saying here are the required comments in various languages. You know, that'll just get. It's like the Milgram experiment, or uh, what was it? Where you know you start them off giving you know giving the people mild your subjects, you give them a, you get them to do these mild things like giving someone a mild shock when they get something wrong. You, starting off doing something fairly harmless and then you work them up to where they're killing people for you. <laughs> and I wonder if I can do the same thing, only it's really not a, it's a really good thing that I'm not having to run for this office because that would not be a great campaign speech. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then uh, who was over here? Yes. Do you foresee a power struggle with Vint Cerf once you start to exercise your authority as president? I have only, I, I, uh, 
I didn't know there was competition. I've only heard about him in the context of some uh, Al Gore quotes, but because he, he's the guy who stood up for Al Gore when Al Gore was like, I invented the internet. You know, he said, I, you know, I took the initiative in creating the internet and everyone made a lot of fun of that. But I mean, really, Al Gore was the, the one politician who was there pushing the legislation through and you know, saying, let's commercialize this. This could really be a cool thing beyond just a scientific tool. And so I'm a big fan of Al Gore. And I noticed Vic, the, the, I think it's the same guy you're mentioning here who, uh, if it's not, it was someone with a similar odd name with VS as the initials. Who had a who had said like you know ever made fun of Al Gore and Al Gore and then this guy was like no no I was there I I was the other guy who invented it and Al, Al Gore totally did <laughs> so you know like and and I uh, I like that um, but no so is, is there someone else who's declared themselves some sort of a ruler what what's the story with this guy <laughs> okay so it's just he invented the internet well then then I mean then you've got the Tim Berners Lee faction and then. You're going to have RMS saying, no, it's the internet slash GNU. <laughs> so I think then it basically comes down to numbers. And if I can get the XKCD people, and then if we've shut down the MySpace faction, which is the other <laughs> one, and we can like acquire them, I think we can win this. So now if we're going to be moving toward internet war, like the question is, We, we've got to know the battleground here. <laughs> huh? We haven't mapped. I'm figuring um, we're going to be launching from the southeast there in that IRC Isles, you know. <laughs> and and that, I think that's, that's the area that XKC is going to come from because that's sort of like the south in general is like IRC and then the blogosphere. But so, so from a protocol point of view, um, let's see. Because I've got the... I was uh, doing some research here. So the, the way I understand it, you've got, there's the uh, seven layer, the seven layers of the internet protocol, where, or you know, these networking protocols where you've got, I think, uh, the physical, Quick question, where are the tubes? <laughs> well, basically, the, uh, you've, got, you've got this flow of packets. Now, the way they work is, I think they originate here on the physical layer. They flow out through using Ajax. <laughs> Up here. Now, this section, there's a layer here that's the uh, TCP, IP, UDP, PNG layer, which is run by AOL, <laughs> where they get filtered out to go to, to their destinations. And this, uh, then there's this long stretch up here, which is referred to as the long tail. Um, they come down around here through what you've got here. Overlapping with these seven layers is the tag cloud. <laughs> they enter down here. Um, they enter the tag cloud up here at web 1.0, hit web 2.0, and at the moment, they circle off through here, you know, and head back into the data link layer, where they're passed up through here, through the internet, through the blogs, 
and eventually make it to MySpace where they're converted to Flash and they automatically play when you open the page. <laughs> So now, the idea is, thanks to, uh, I believe it's Ruby on Rails and, and uh, this new Python stuff, we're able, we've got the Rails right here, <laughs> which will get us all the way down to Web 3.0, <laughs> bringing us around this way, back up to the data link layer, or the, back up to the physical layer here, which takes us through. Completing the circuit. <laughs> and um, the, the thing is, the, uh, the flow of packets here in this retrograde motion, that, uh, I'm sorry if I'm getting too technical here, but <clears throat> this, uh, that, that retrograde motion causes a flux up through the center of this circle here. Um, it's a, it's a, a social phenomenon that causes a surge of podcasts. <laughs> to head from AOL back into the blogs. <laughs> and, um, and, and that all happens again via Ajax. <laughs> and this, uh, this is, this, there's, so there's the flux through there stimulating the podcasts, flux, uh, the RSS feed flux comes around the circle through the core and the whole cycle is called the blogosphere. And so that's how the internet works. It has been really great talking to you all and I hope to see more of you around the conference the rest of the day. And I will be up here if anyone wants to come up and you know, talk about anything and for a little while. And then for the rest of the time, I will just be wandering around the conference, possibly sleeping for nine, ten hours at a randomly chosen point in the day. <laughs> but hopefully I will see you around. And thank you so much all for coming. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Sweet. Got it recorded. You had another uh, crowd outside in uh, the atrium. Oh, really? Yeah, it was broadcast on the Oh, video. man. Nice. Yeah. Can you oh. shake the hand and draw us that kind of Can you sign that? Can I get that? Oh, sure. <laughs>